thank you, Raphael, for inviting me to Belgium. I'm honored to give the keynote here at the Catholic University of Leuven. My hot topic today is putting a girdle around the earth, the dissemination of global criticism of Shakespearean adaptations. Criticism has come a long way since Matthew Arnold defined it in the 19th century as a disinterested endeavor to learn the best that is known and thought of in the world. Literary criticism, like other forms of cultural practices, is informed by vested interests. These vested interests emerge out of what Hans Robert Yaus calls the reader's horizon of expectation, namely culturally and historically specific conventions that govern how critics decode texts and performances. My study of the international circulation of literary criticism has revealed that Arnold's idea of disinterested and impartial criticism is simply a function of social privilege. The claims of politically neutral or historically objective criticism are nothing more than an illusion based on willing acceptance of presumptions. Today, the enterprise of criticism is a form of evidence-based argumentation and reasoned consideration of literature. It is practiced in traditional long-form scholarly writing, short-form journalism, practice-based research, practice as research, and many other formats beyond Arnold's context of Victorian poetry. Now, what is Shakespeare criticism? What is Shakespearean criticism? While Shakespeare criticism is a unique subgenre of criticism, it includes all the forms I mentioned, as well as textual and paratextual materials, bolderization, bolderization, critical footnotes, laudatory or skeptical prefaces, translations of the plays and sonnets as a form of criticism, critical reviews of theater and from video commentary, live writing, and memoirs, and adaptations themselves as a form of critical responses to a work. The circulation of these diverse forms of criticism may not be immediately obvious due to the diffuse nature of disseminating ideas on varied but connected cultural terrains. We have to watch out for claimed affinity with Shakespeare, for claimed indifference to, and resistance of Shakespeare. For instance, along with the Romantics, Sauron Kierkegaard is well known for his admiration of Shakespeare. The Danish philosopher ends up appropriating King Lear as a guiding force in his books, Either Or, and stages on life's way. In contrast, the 1920 Norwegian Nobel laureate for literature, Knut Hamsun, like his contemporaries George Bernard Shaw and Leo Tolstoy, rejected Shakespeare's aesthetic merits. These positivist and antithetical strands that coexist in Nordic reception histories of Shakespeare. Relational cultural meanings emerge through negation of and negotiation with Shakespeare. That is to say, there are no singular unitary centers and peripheries in the international circulation of Shakespeare criticism. Working with German and French versions, 18th century Nordic translators brought Shakespeare's texts and continental European cultures to bear on each other. In these cultural transactions, Englishness was but one of several components, alongside those from continental Europe. Instead of reinforcing cultural hierarchy and the idea of unilinear transmission of cultures, the early translations, as a form of criticism, created a web of interconnectedness that empowered readers and audiences for whom English was a second or third language. Now, let us turn to a contemporary case study. Tom Cheeseman had this project called Version Variation Visualization Multilingual Crowdsourcing of Othello. And this is an example of translation as criticism and of practice as research. Comparative analysis of translations of the same passage can shed new light on words that would have elided attention. In Act One, Scene Three of Othello, 
After Othello's eloquent defense of his love of Desdemona, the Duke of Venice tells Brabantio at the end of the court scene that if virtue no delighted beauty lack, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. The Duke's remarks are commonly understood as underhanded and racist praises of Othello's, Othello's virtue and appearance, though they provide ample opportunities for multilingual interpretation. Cheeseman's digital project focuses on these two lines. The website lists 200 collated translations in 30 languages and offers English translations of the foreign language versions of these two lines. The translators Choices words reflect how social markers such as gender, class, immigration status create and amplify one's desires and needs. Translational differences draw attention to the instability of Shakespeare's texts as well as their variegated terrains that are open for interpretation. Now, New Oxford Shakespeare acknowledges this diversity of the enterprise of criticism. Published in 2016, the new Oxford replaces traditional introductions to individual plays by excerpts from contemporary and pre-modern criticism by scholars, directors, poets, translators, artists, and more. These quotations appear before each play. Compared to modern editions of Shakespeare, the new Oxford includes more global and diverse voices. New variorum Shakespeare is another example. So Oxford's move toward globalizing Shakespeare criticism in a mini is in a miniaturized variorum format provides an interesting contrast to the series called the New Variorum Shakespeare. Founded by Horace Howard Furness, the NBS lists shorter quotations from critics of textual studies in footnotes. The proliferation of global Shakespeare criticism in both form and scale is an opportunity and a challenge for the NBS, which is now uh, backed by the Modern Language Association, the MLA. According to its original mission statement since 1871, the NBS has served as a guide to everything of significance known about the place and poems, including sources and influences, textual evolution, critical heritage, and stage history. You will note, for instance, film history and histories of translation were not on that list, for they were not deemed worthy of inclusion. Nonetheless, some scholars argue that a series value lies in its encyclopedic coverage. Over time, the new variorum Shakespeare's Anglo-Eurocentric focus begins to pale in the face of global Shakespeare studies. It includes only Shakespeare criticism produced in the US, UK, Canada, and the Western Europe and English, and so-called major European languages. Argentinian scholarship in Spanish, for example, is not recovered. In fact, the same Anglo-centric logic was adopted by the J store when they launched the Understanding Series in 2019. The JSTOR Understanding Series connects primary text in English language journal articles and book chapters that cite those texts. A majority of the journals are based in North America and the UK, similar to the NVS in organizing principles, but its digital interface is more user-friendly. It contains all of Shakespeare's plays and sonnets, a column of running numbers, tells you how many articles cite the exact line. Cordelia's Nothing, My Lord, in King Lear, is cited frequently. The primary text serves as an index or a portal to other texts of interest. When I chaired the MLA Executive Committee on the new Variorum Shakespeare, we were tasked with bringing the edition that was founded in 1871 into the 21st century. We debated such questions as raison d'etre, why track global circulation of Shakespeare criticism? Genre, what type of writing counts as criticism? Gatekeeping, of course, what is worthy of inclusion? What about a celebrity's tweet or a politician's comment? Do we include those? And finally, inclusiveness, how do we expand the new variorum's coverage in terms of form and shape? 
Today, I'm going to focus on the first question of metacriticism. I will work from a growing archive of Shakespeare criticism. Now, why do we track international circulation of Shakespeare criticism? Tracking international circulation of criticism can enhance our understanding of the logic of cultural exchange of Shakespeare's texts and of the raison d'etre of our enterprise. The absence of critical or performance history can serve as a form of negative evidence anthropologically speaking. If something is not there, it is it actually bears anthropological significance. So take Henry V, for example. This play had never been staged professionally in the French language in a major venue in France until 1999. This is significant when we consider that there is a long history of French engagement with Shakespeare, including all three parts of Henry VI. If we expand the scope to Francophone countries and smaller venues, there was a production of Henry V in French directed by Claude Etienne at the Palais des Beaux-Arts in Brussels, Belgium in 1953. As renowned actor Philippe Torreton puts it, French producers cannot imagine Napoleon being invited to attend a representation of this triumphal English epic in the land of France. However, now in the post-Brexit context, Henry V is gaining traction as it involves, evolves from a patriotic partisan drama into one of healing and reconciliation, according to French academic Florence March. When a play is familiar to a particular culture, criticism may still take surprising turns. Let us turn to The Merchant of Venice. This play was the most frequently staged Shakespearean comedy in the Middle East in the 20th century. It was often chosen as the play for inaugural theater events, such as those at the Iraqi Center for Theater and Egypt's National Theater Group. It was typically staged as an anti-Zionist and anti-Israeli affair. One may assume the local histories would always affect critics' view of Shakespeare, but there are plenty of counterintuitive cases. Israeli-Palestinian conflicts, for example, had not been brought to bear on merchant in local critical traditions on the Arabian Peninsula, as one might expect from the performance history. Further, even though Arabic language criticism frequently interprets merchant as a cautionary tale about usury, which is forbidden by Islamic law, prominent scholars such as Ibrahim al-Mazini have sided with Shylock, viewing the character with empathy. Beyond merchant, Diasporic artists such as British Kuwaiti bilingual playwright Suleiman al Bassam have brought Anglophone critical traditions to the Middle East and other parts of the world through their touring productions. On the screen, you can see a staged photo of the Arabic version of his Al Hamlet Summit on tour to Tokyo in 2004, in which an Islamist Hamlet confronts the suicide bomber Ophelia, set in the Arabian Gulf. This adaptation critiques Western journalistic misunderstanding of Middle Eastern politics. Meanwhile, Arabic language criticism is now being circulated in the West thanks to leading Anglophone scholars such as Catherine Hennessy and Margaret Lippin. These are extraordinary stories the new variorum hopes to capture. Here is an example taken from the latest digital edition of Admit Samanai's Dream, running comments by various historical and commenter contemporary Anglophone critics appear on the right, organized chronologically as one reads the play. The line, if we shadows have offended in the epilogue, for instance, comes with copious annotations. The commentary selected elucidates textual rather than performative meanings and is drawn from British American traditions. A brave new vista would open up if actor Philippe Torreton, scholar Ibrahim Mazini, and director Suleiman Abbasam and the likes are included in the variorum. The problem is that each 
new variorum play is headed only by one or two editors rather than an international committee of correspondents, as is the case for world Shakespeare bibliography. So it has proven impossible to achieve the global coverage that we aspire to. The global, the world Shakespeare bibliography is in fact the only indexing tool that covers a truly international range of criticism, though it is not pegged to any version of Shakespeare's text, like the New Variorum or like JSTOR. The World Shakespeare Bibliography, WSB, is far more global than the MLA International Bibliography, the NDS, and the New Oxford combined. With a team of correspondents based on men, in many countries, the WSB provides English language summaries of artifacts in other languages. It covers not only articles and books, but also editions, adaptations, and digital projects. At the NVS, the new variorum, we decided that open access and crowdsourcing emerged as one answer to this, this problem. We re released the full XML files as open access resources. XML, or extensible markup language, is a file format for storing and transmitting text that are both human and machine readable. This meta language enables editors to display documents on the internet in ways that they define which is useful for play texts. We hosted annual competitions for the best digital variorum projects that make the most innovative use of the data sets. Despite our effort, the new variorum did not quite go global in the sense, in both the senses of including more global voices and of recruiting more users from different parts of the world. This is a function of how the Shakespeare industry is set up and maintained, which I am analyzing today. So here's what I have learned from the new Oxford, new variorum, and world Shakespeare bibliography, as well as JSTOR. Shakespeare criticism is really a boomerang enterprise, a phenomenon that is fueled simultaneously by globalized economic and cultural development. This field is distinct in several ways from the global dissemination of criticism of other cultural figures, such as Immanuel Kant in Asia or Confucius in Europe. So first, criticism of Kant or Confucius focuses primarily on text. In contrast, a large part of Shakespeare's global afterlife lies in the reception of the plays and their performative adaptations on stage and on screen, as our foregoing examples uh, on the Arabian Peninsula have shown. Over the centuries, Shakespeare criticism has taken diverse forms, including rewriting and translation, traditional dramatic criticism, and criticism of adaptations that circulate globally. Significantly, performance criticism influences new adaptations. The Victorian essayist Charles and Mary Lambs published Tales from Shakespeare in 1806. It is a collection of didactic appropriations of select tragedies by Charles and comedies by Mary. The book was initially intended for women and children who would not otherwise have access to Shakespeare's plays. The categorization of children's book is deceiving. The Lamb's collection became one of the most popular English language rewritings in the world, with 97 Japanese versions and reprints between 1877 and 1928 and a dozen Chinese editions between 1903 and 1915. The Lamb's tales, rather than complete translation of the plays themselves, or even translations of traditional forms of criticism, became the foundation for Asian Shakespeare criticism, and such adaptations as you know it to Tomo's 1883 bestseller, A Strange Story from the West, The Trial of formed human flesh, which is based on the Merchant of Venice in the Lamb's book. The Lamb's translational interpretations of Shakespeare influenced the critical traditions throughout East Asia. The same is true in several other cultures. This is one of the most compelling cases of intra-regional and inter-regional circulation of adaptation as criticism. Literary translation can function as a form of criticism, as well as evidenced 
by early 20th century Taiwanese writer Liang Shiqiu's translation of the complete works. Influenced by Matthew Arnold, A.C. Bradley's character criticism, and Irving Babbitt's new humanism, Mr. Liang went against the grain and class-based view of literature of his time to contend that human nature should be the sole standard for measuring literature. As a humanist, Liang was interested in the universal literary experience and its artistic rather than political function. Like Boomerang, Shakespeare criticism takes circuitous roads around the globe and returns to various cultures in new forms. Just like Park in A Midsummer Night's Dream, who boasts that I'll put a girdle round about the earth in 40 minutes. The age of digital cultural globalization has accelerated the boomerang's velocity and trajectories. Circuitous roads cut through geocultural space and time. Criticism from the same time period, but written in different languages, may not be in sync with each other in terms of their viewpoints. Plays that have been traveling the world since Shakespeare's lifetime are now returning to Britain with many different hats. The meaning of this return is ambiguous because touring productions make the familiar strange and bring home the exotic. UK tours have come to define some of the most memorable productions in the recent past, and international collaborations have inspired artists in Britain and elsewhere. So Boomerang Shakespeare encompasses a range of events, including non-Anglophone productions, co-productions by British and foreign artists, local events celebrating Shakespeare's global afterlife, and British productions that incorporate elements from more than one culture in their cast, style, or set. Shakespeare criticism, of course, is very much part of this boomerang enterprise, as British and foreign critics often hold contrasting views on these performances and on Shakespeare's stature in modern culture. The same production or film, when on tour, would garner praises in one culture, but trigger diametrically opposed critique in another location. It is not uncommon for a work to be criticized for its orientalist or Eurocentric penchant and praised for its global relevance. And the phenomenon is not limited to stage productions either. This feature of global differentials in criticism is useful for furthering our understanding of world cultures as well as Shakespeare's afterlife. Here's an example of the contrast between the Japanese and foreign reception of the same production. So the production in question is by Yukio Ninagawa. It is his 1980 Cherry Blossom Macbeth. The production featured a huge cherry tree whose petals fall in many scenes. Ninagawa is internationally renowned for his repeated use of the motif of cherry blossom in Macbeth. Death is actually associated with cherry trees in full blossom, a symbol of transcendental beauty and the repose of the soul. Minagawa's rehearsal notes state that the cherry blossom is a sensuous invitation to death. Critics at Japanese and international venues see it alternatively as a samurai story infused with Buddhist rituals, a stage work with Kurosawa-inspired cinematic qualities, an innovative kabuki performance, a relatively conservative interpretation of the universal morals of Macbeth, a self-serving, self-orientalizing production that appropriates Japanese tradition out of their local context, and sometimes all of the above. Critics who believe the Ninagawa Macbeth to be an example of self-orientalization accuse the directors of peddling Japanese to Western festivals, while scholars who see Ninagawa as staging authentic Japanese aesthetics, they praise the production's success in internationalizing Japanese theater. Here's this another example from the West. Set in Meiji, Japan, Kenneth Branagh's 2006 
film As You Like It is a dream of Japan, as its prologue reminds us. This dream opens with the Duke, Rosalind, Celia, and the courtiers attending a kabuki performance and closes with a lavish wedding ceremony in the Japanese garden filled with colorful dreamers and ornate kimonos. The film dresses Waker's place up with a Zen garden, shrine gate, and trappings of a 19th century Japan torn between samurai and European merchants. The intercultural fusion is reflected by Rosalind's and Celia's Victorian dresses during the sumo match between Orlando and Charles. Sitting behind them, the Duke Frederick dons dark samurai armor, which smacks of cultural appropriation. Orlando writes love letters in Japanese kanji scripts while speaking lines from Shakespeare in English. Both Shakespeare and the Dream of Japan are deployed ornamentally in the filmmaker's signature visual romanticism. Japanese critics and reviews, uh, such as those by Shoichiro Kawai and Ryota Minami, bemoaned the film's misappropriation of the perceived Japanese passivity and stoicism. In contrast, Anglophone scholars such as Mark Thornton Burnett believes Brana's concept of Englishman abroad is, for better or worse, a necessary move in global marketplace where the West's economic power is waning. As shown by these brief but paradigm-setting paradigm examples of global dissemination of Shakespeare criticism, there's often a gap between artistic intent and audience response, or what Umberto Eco has called aberrant decoding. It is the phenomenon where the receiver interprets a message differently from the intention of the sender. What global Shakespeare criticism reveals is not Shakespeare's universality, but rather the critic's local specificity. Aberrant decoding rarely occurs in culturally homogeneous settings, but it is a norm in intercultural contexts where critics and artists do not share the same cultural heritage. Accidental meanings in this type of criticism can be productive and gener generative in some context in the sense of inspiring artistic creativity. Aberrant decoding can produce the artistically positive effects of flipping stereotypes and offering an alternative pathway into a classic work with established interpretations. For example, post-colonial interpretations of The Tempest. In this context, the global circulation of Shakespeare criticism is both an exercise in ethics and in cultural agency. Shakespeare criticism, as papers at this conference have shown, is in fact a form of cultural criticism. The study of the dissemination of Shakespeare criticism now forms a key component of global Shakespeare studies. We need to go beyond questions of mutual influence among only scholarly critics to consider how new audiences and new forms of criticism are shaping the Shakespeare industry. Now we have some new questions to consider. What are the ethics of cross-cultural criticism? How do we handle uneven valuation of Shakespeare and of different cultures? And how might criticism become a practice of cultural reparation in a culture of care? Literary criticism carries with it strong ethical implications. Ethics refer to one's willingness to listen to and to be subjected to the demands of others in the polyphony of voices, including voices once obscured by history. And this polyphony of voices can regain relevance and moral agency. The international circulation of criticism entails letting through and enabling feeble voices. Since no one can ever be global or polyglot enough, it would be too easy to simply launch an allegation about how we fail to engage with criticism from the Middle East, Africa, and the Global South. It would be too easy to accuse our enterprise of Anglo-Eurocentrism. I would like to take a risky road to find new solutions by creating an ethical mode of knowledge creation and dissemination. 
After all, how one sees determines what one sees. Global perspectives are multifocal, multilingual, and multicultural viewpoints. As a result, the international circulation of Shakespeare criticism gives us an opportunity to actively tackle epistemic exclusion of select critical perspectives. For example, global perspectives can help us tackle the pervasive whiteness of Shakespeare studies by deconstructing the binary logic of black-white order, which inadvertently naturalizes the two as the monolithic concepts. As Amberin Dadaboy observes, our gaze is often implicated in our own racial, gendered, and class positions. Identifying common patterns of racism in interconnected contexts, for example, can strengthen local campaigns. Maintaining global perspectives can break down binarism and enhance our cognitive bandwidth. A case in point is the small gold and disguised copy of the complete works of Shakespeare, affectionately known as the Robben Island Bible in the South African Penitentiary for Political Prisoners off the coast of Cape Town. This book was said to have inspired Nelson Mandela while he was in prison there. Many South African political prisoners signed their names next to, to passages that were important to them. The passage Nelson Mandela chose on December 16, 1977, was Julius Caesar's stoic defiance before leaving for the Senate on the Ides of March. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. In British and American journalist discourses, these lines supposedly taught Mandela how to dream and how to rise from the ashes. The story about the Robben Island Bible has gained much more traction outside South Africa, particularly in London, thanks to the British Museum's exhibition during the 2012 London Olympics. This was followed by an, an exhibition at the Folger Shakespeare Library, Library in Washington, D.C. in 2013. In fact, many political prisoners who signed their names in that complete works could not recall their choice of passage or its significance during interviews. For individuals directly involved, the political purchase of this citation was no longer relevant. South African scholars are more realistic in their assessment of the claims about Shakespeare's moral centrality to the liberation movement. Ashwin Desai, in his book based on interviews with eight former inmates, cautions that Shakespeare is part of a Eurocentric canon that crowds out valuable and more relevant Black and female voices. Contrary to the British media celebration of Shakespeare's centrality in South African politics, prominent figures in the post-liberation African National Congress disav disavowed the Robben Island Bible's significance in political reform. Jackson Mpembu, former ANC spokesman and parliamentarian, said it is not an inspiration and only iconic quote to those who want to make it iconic. This is an instance of ethical impact in the eyes of beholders. In fact, it is not the South African politicians, but British cultural institutions, such as the British Museum, that are deeply invested in the notion of Shakespeare setting things right, both within and outside the UK. Appropriations by both politicians and artists have tapped into Shakespeare's perceived remedial functions. Understanding that the meanings of any adaptation or performance are relational can lead to a deeper appreciation of how multiple localities are brought together to craft a new narrative. Take John Carney's work, for example, his 1987 landmark performance of Othello in Janet Suzman's production at the Market Theatre in Johannesburg received critical acclaim, known internationally for his performance of King Chaka in Black Panther, directed by Ryan Ugler. Uh, produced by Marvel in 2018, and Captain America Civil War in 2016. John Carney is one of the most prominent South African actors today. As a Black Othello under apartheid in 1987, Carney's presence alone 
was a milestone in self-representation and equality, similar to Ira Aldrich's first Black Othello in London in 1825, when exclusively white cast were the norm. The significance of Connie's and Aldrich's performance is diametrically opposed to that of Laurence Olivier's Black Face Othello in Stuart Burge's 1965 film version. Black face performances signify differently in South Africa, the UK, the Europe, and Europe due to variances in social discourses about race. By contrast, John Carney's Caliban in the 2009 Tempest accrued divergent meanings in Cape Town and London, leading to uneven reception. Anthony Sher, a British actor of South African origin, played Prospero in that production. Sher's younger Prospero kept Carney's elderly Caliban on a tether and delivered the epilogue as an apology to Caliban rather than to the audience. The production received favorable reviews when it toured Britain, where the post-colonial allegory helped white audiences justify enjoyment of the African carnival. The production's global reception is then at odds with its re reception in South Africa. Noting John Carney's status as the master of the post apartheid stage, South African scholar Sandy Young pointed out that to cast Kani as the supposed monster is to invite outrage before he has spoken a word in Caliban's voice. Within South Africa, the production was not as successful as the 1987 Othello because by 2009, the idea of decolonization was no longer politically revolutionary. Audiences were also divided over the staging's humor, which offended some, but for others helped to bring a welcome lightheartedness in Sandy Young's review, the production reflected a post apartheid hermeneutic heaving with anger at decades of racial injustice. This goes to show that encountering intercultural Shakespeare criticism is really an experience similar to listening to interweaving parts in a fugue, a contrapuntal musical piece that introduces a melody through one instrument and then develops that same melody through other instruments successively. Useful here is the concept of polyphony, a theory of musicology. Mikhail Bakhtin introduced polyphony to literary studies in his, in his analysis of Fyodor Dostoevsky's novels. I use polyphony in literal and metaphorical senses to discuss the synthesis of different and contrasting voices in international criticism. The concept of polyphony sheds light on Shakespeare criticism as a practice contains and sustains multiple voices of the text. The these directors and the critics without subordinating, subordinating any one perspective. Polyphony includes differing and sometimes contradictory voices. Each voice has its own trajectory, its own authority, its own weight in a narrative. As a result, polyphony produces uncanny echoes, which reveals the reader's horizon of expectation. There are, of course, silences, which are equally significant as echoes. In some contexts, scholars may not have full access to sensitive or restricted archives, or maybe in order to protect their interviewees, they cannot really talk about certain productions. We shall take a closer look at the polyphonic ecosystem whence international Shakespeare criticism emerges. I would like to examine contradictory British, German, and Korean criticism of one production. Ote Suk's Romeo and Juliet is a landmark in the history of post-1990 Korean Shakespeare. It is also one of the earliest mainstream South Korean productions to tour to the UK. This adaptation has its own three and a half decades of history of polyphony before Anglophone, critic, Anglophone critics picked up on its importance. As you can see on the screen, the production was also notable for a generally comedic vibe that contrasted strongly with its ominous and tragic opening and final scenes. The combination of humor and tragic narrative tripped Western audiences up, however. 
The production featured characters with Korean names in a Korean setting and quasi-traditional Korean costumes filled with color symbolism. Uh, one clan wore brown and the other green. Our next slide shows the scene of Romeo in Juliet's bedroom. This scene played out with a heightened sense of frustration. The stage was covered with a gigantic white sheet and Romeo spent a good part of the scene hunting down Juliet as she scurried under the cover. He never successfully undressed Juliet and according to the Guardian, quote, struggled historically to even remove Juliet's white socks, even when she willingly offered her fee, end of quote. All also introduced metatheatrical framing into the performance in the important balcony scene in which Juliet is obsessed with names in the speech act of naming. What's in a name that which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. The two characters have no names. They are known only as a maiden and a bachelor. Romeo and Juliet represent every man as all turns Shakespeare's place into a story of irreconcilable enmity. When they speak to each other, they look for approval from the audiences. The three-way dialogue between characters through the audience goes against post-Victorian theatrical naturalism, which may be a source of confusion for reviewers. The technique works to bring audiences into the fold of the fabula of the Korean narrative and in the pit at the Barbican Center. It effectively expanded the small stage in an intimate venue. The final thing of Julia's suicide also departs from the more conventional aestheticization of the couple's suffering and martyrdom. Julia is clearly in agony as she runs Romeo's dagger into her stomach, creating an ironic distance from the euphemism happy dagger. Surprise gives way to regret as she exclaims, my stomach hurts. And in this, this production, her collapse did not result in a choreographed landing on Romeo. O's production made headlines at the Bremer Shakespeare Festival in Germany in 2001, where the Weisse Kurier, one of the major daily newspapers in Bremen, compared the production to an unrolling beautiful picture scroll. The focus on postcard perfect visual exoticism is a classic reaction in Western media to touring Asian performances. In the fall of 2006, all 90 minute highly compact Romeo and Juliet went to the Barbican Center in London. Korean critics took great pride in seeing one of the most prolific contemporary Korean playwrights represented at a prestigious British venue. They hailed the production's arrival in, quote, the Shakespeare kingdom, where it faced the descendants of a Shakespearean audience as a historical event in Korean theater and a zenith of the Shakespearean boom in South Korea. The British reception was mixed. The polyphony of reception is exemplified by the ways in which German critics responded to the visual aesthetics, Korean critics fo focused on national pride rather than qualities of the production itself, and British newspapers compared it to other non-English language state words. A closer look at what drew the critics' attention sheds light on the range of meanings Asian Shakespeare's hold outside of Asia. The highly stylized production was characterized by an aesthetics of self-restraint. It prioritized stillness over dramatic explosions of emotions. Sam Marlowe found the production bewildering because the comedy obliterated any sense of romantic or tragic power. His analysis that everything is lost in translation overlooks the fact that Shakespearean drama is nurtured by a hybrid tragic comic mode of expression itself. Romeo and Juliet is peppered with fast paced, improbable plot developments that are closer to fables. In contrast, Luke Jennings in a review titled Less Really Is More appreciated the genuine tragedy that contrasted starkly with the comedic moments. Eve, Mary, Oster Osterlin called it comically grotesque. 
Okay, so combined comic and tragic modes of storytelling to convey the intertwined themes of enmity and love in Shakespeare. The tragic, this strategy created both resonances and discord. Some critics were unsure if Oz's production was, quote, a convergence or collision of cultural traditions. As for the production's meanings, Will Sharp felt that the adaptation reflects current political realities in Korea, a country at war with itself. Taking this one step further, Jason Best wrote in the stage that the bitter division between North and South Korea informed the feuding clans, but he quickly and dismissively pointed out that countless other productions around the world can claim similar weight. The facts that the Capulets and Montagues fail to reconcile and the entire set collapses in rain and thunder seem to invite these political readings of the production as an allegory for the irreconcilable relationship between North and South Korea. This tendency creates distorted understandings of non-Western works. The approach is based on the conviction that the best way to understand non-Western works is by interpreting their engagement with pragmatic politics. This approach may imply that non-Western works are of interest solely because of their testimonial value. It also tends to characterize a non-Western artwork based on stereotypes of its nation of origin. In thinking with and thinking about the international circulation of Shakespeare criticism, I have found versions of myself in parallel universes. I have also brought this research into the classroom. In closing, I would like to share with you my reflections on the pedagogical implications of global Shakespeare criticism. Students often look through rather than at characters who are minoritized in one way or another, especially characters who are unnamed. Audiences of a majority racial group often approach fiction through a colorblind gaze, one that erases the presence of racialized others who are seen but not truly seen. The aforementioned Kenneth Branagh's Japanese film As You Like It is one such example. But such a work is still valuable pedagogically if we teach it alongside global criticism. It can be a test case to help us place racial discourses across history in a global context and to rethink race through what is commonly regarded as a non-race film. Once we compare and contrast international criticism of this film, we gain a deeper understanding of its unexamined assumptions. Similarly, canonical adaptations such as Bart Lerman's William Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet from 1996 can be taught alongside global criticism to shed a new light on its own vision of globalization, shot primarily in Mexico City and Boca del Rio in Veracruz. Lerman's film is set in a fictional American city called Verona Beach. It pitches North American Protestantism against Latin American Catholicism, which is then mapped onto cinematic, cinematic interpretations of the conflict between the Montagues and the Capulets, each claim marked with the distinct accents and sartorial choices. The action scenes frequently punctured by the freeze frames of slow motion shots are filtered through John Woo's Hong Kong action movie and hip hop rap. Even though ethnic difference such as Latin, Latinx culture is used allegorically to frame the ancient field in Shakespeare's play. And despite the film's borrowing from several other cultures, the film has not typically been taught from the perspective of a global or of a global studies or critical race studies. This is due to Lerman's use of Shakespeare's text for indexical value. Characters clad in jeans delivering lines from Romeo and Juliet give the false impression that the film is a specimen of Anglophone Shakespeare rather than global Shakespeare. So scholarship on Lerman's film focuses more frequently on gender issues rather than cross-cultural and racial misinterpretations. Translations and circulation of criticism created new communities. French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy has described this kind of community as a shared space of being together that is defined by its being in common, but not by universal sameness. 
right? So it's important to recognize the being in commonness. The concept of community can be applied to the international circulation of Shakespeare criticism as a form of being in common, the standing in relations between two texts. Thank you for joining me today. Mm -hmm.